Hi, my name is Cheryl, and today I want to talk to you about Mystery Babylon. If you ever inquire about Mystery Babylon, you'll find that there are dozens of YouTube videos, there are literally hundreds of articles and hundreds of books, I think, written about Mystery Babylon. So why is Mystery Babylon so important? Well, it is important to Christians because in the book of Revelation, uh, it does talk about Mystery Babylon. So we need to know what Mystery Babylon is so we can actually uh, understand what that scriptures, what the scriptures in Revelation are actually telling us. So firstly, Mystery Babylon is a mystery. So what is a mystery? A mystery is a bit of an enigma, something that's a bit of a puzzle, a bit hard to understand really. So you have to sort of dig a little bit deep to find out what a mystery is. And of course, we all know what Babylon is, because Babylon is one of those ancient civilizations that was extremely powerful. And it influenced a lot of civilizations after it. And according to the Bible, uh, we are actually still being influenced by ancient Babylon. Maybe not in a physical sense, or maybe still in a physical sense, but we are definitely being influenced by ancient Babylon in a spiritual sense. So really that's what this video is all about today and uh, ancient Babylon is both, uh, you know, there is a huge amount of uh, extra biblical material for ancient Babylon and there's also biblical material for ancient Babylon. So it's not like there's nothing about ancient Babylon or oh, we need to uh, somehow, you know, find out about it because there is a tremendous amount of information out there. It's just a case of processing all that information and trying to find out what it is. So when you actually start to look at some of these videos, you'll find all articles or books or whatever, you'll find that basically everybody falls into a the same, same hole, if you like. And they all say that Mystery Babylon is a who. So the number one suspect for Mystery Babylon, according to scholars out there and some of them are not scholars they're just people who like to research and do things like me and uh, they actually spend a huge amount of time uh, researching this information and getting getting uh, information together and I take my hat off to them because you know they don't get paid for it or whatever they just do it because they love doing it so the number one suspect for mystery Babylon is actually the Catholic Church so everybody seems to think, the majority of people seem to think that the Catholic Church is actually Mystery Babylon. Now, why do they think that the Catholic Church is Mystery Babylon? Well, there are many, many reasons why they do. But uh, some of them are because of Catholic uh, Church being very ritual and, and they see some of the traditions uh, that were in ancient Babylon as being carried through into the Catholic Church. Also, Catholic Church has a, a, a big emphasis on a queen, a, a mother, which was a very much a Babylonian thing. Uh, I think that Martin Luther, now I'm the reformer, not the black activist, but Martin Luther actually had uh, a lot to do with that, I think. And I've been privileged to read a tremendous amount about Martin Luther. And I think that Martin Luther actually um, didn't really mean what people th think that he meant. They think that I think that somehow because he talks about the Babylonian captivity that he is actually talking about uh, Mystery Babylon. I, I think that what Martin Luther was referring to was the Catholic Church, the power of the Catholic Church uh, at his particular, the, in his day. Uh, and that the church and the state were one. And that he resented that uh, because it affected uh, the Protestants and those the non-Catholics. Uh, also, he um, felt that that captivity or feeling that feeling captive to the Catholic Church somehow reminded him of when the Jews were in exile and they were being held captive in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. So I think that that's really where he was going with that, but I could be wrong, I don't know. Islam is number two on the list of uh, people thinking that they are Mystery Babylon because Islam originated from that particular area of the world. That Islam has a lot of um, Babylonian practices also. And Islam uh, 
uh, aspects of Islam, parts of Islam, uh, follow some very cruel and very harsh laws that are almost identical to that of Hammurabi, uh, the great um, Babylonian king. And these laws were written on his steles and they were there for all to see. And uh, there was tremendous punishments and very harsh punishments dis dished out to people who were not um, uh, complying, I guess, with you know what he wanted them to do. The other thing about Islam I found that people talk about Nana, the, the moon god from Babylon. And Nana was, uh, had her symbol or her icon, if you like, uh, which was the crescent moon. And so people associate that with um, uh, Islam being Mystery Babylon. The third suspect of who is Mystery Babylon, according to all the writers out there, uh, they say that um, Jerusalem is Mystery Babylon, so all of a sudden Mystery Babylon has actually become a place. And they say that because there again, they see a lot of similarities. The people who have studied Judaism see similarities between um, Judaism and Babylon. And uh, I read a tremendous amount of Jewish literature from Jewish authors. And uh, I would say a lot of them are actually say, you know, some, sometimes, you know, a festival is Canaanite, which has its origins in Babylon and, you know, things like that. It depends, depending on how, you know, uh, uh, spiritual I guess that they are and um, so there is this uh, thing the Talmud also was written uh, in Babylon so it, they people believe that it's been influenced by um, by Babylonian religion and traditions so the last group of people are more of a mixed bunch you know uh, they kind of, you know, they say, oh, the EU is Mystery Babylon, the UN is Mystery Babylon. So there again, Babylon sort of becomes more of a political entity in this case. Uh, some people say that secret societies are Mystery Babylon and other people say that Mystery Babylon is, um, uh, you know, the Illuminati or something like that. So there's a huge range of people out there who say what they think is Mystery Babylon. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think about Mystery Babylon. Uh, a lot of these uh, things that I've read to you, they, they might not necessarily be my personal opinions, um, but although some of them are, but uh, they are they are basically the opinions that I've picked up along the way when actually, you know, looking at what people thought about Mystery Babylon. I don't believe that we can put Mystery Babylon in a box. I don't believe that Mystery Babylon is a who or Mystery Babylon is an entity. I think that Mystery Babylon is more of a what. I don't think that we can label Mystery Babylon and I don't think that it's like um, if you put Mystery Babylon in a box and then people say, well, oh, if you come out of the Catholic Church, then you're not in Mystery Babylon. Or if you come out of Islam, you're not in Mystery Babylon. Or if you come out of some other, you know, secret society. Well, I'm not in, I'm not in the Catholic Church. I'm not in Islam. I'm not in a secret society. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, part of any other you know, cult, I'm an evangelical Christian. So where does that leave me? Does that mean that I am not in Mystery Babylon? And I am fine right now. I don't, I've got nothing to worry about. You see, that's where I think that the deception comes into it. And I think that you are seriously wrong if you actually think that. Because Mystery Babylon is a spiritual force. And I think that when we start to forget about who Mystery Babylon is and focus on what Mystery Babylon is, we will start to see that Mystery Babylon has influenced pretty much um, every religion in the world, that Mystery Babylon has influenced every culture in the world, that Mystery Babylon has influenced every nation in the world, and that Mystery Babylon to some extent has influenced every individual on this earth. So what we need to do is we actually need to find out what Mystery Babylon represents. And we need to root down and we need to rip this thing out. Because we know that there is a judgment coming to Mystery Babylon. And, and Jesus warned us in the book of Revelation, we don't want to be anywhere near Mystery Babylon when she gets judged.
Okay, but I'll get on to that later. So I'll just have a sip of water. The first aspect of Mystery Babylon that I want to deal with today is actually war. Now the god, the patron god of um, Babylon was Marduk. And Marduk was a very, very mean, nasty dude. He was the sort of bloke that you didn't really want to get on the wrong side of. You know, Marduk uh, liked the sword. And if the sword was pointing upwards, you know, Marduk was very happy with you. If your sword was pointing down, Marduk is not happy with you. So that was basically Marduk's position in life. This is a god, it's a spiritual force, but this is what he required. So every spring, the kings of Babylon used to go out and they used to wage wars against each other and they used to capture people and, you know, take booty and, and you know, take women. And uh, I don't want to know to talk about what they most likely did. But I expect, uh, knowing the character of Marduk, that uh, it was pretty, pretty gross. And let's just leave it at that. So we have this um, nasty dude who has people going out and killing themselves. And they want to please him. So they keep their swords up, pointed upwards all the time. And by doing that, they live in a, in a total perpetual state of war. Now, what a terrible, terrible place to actually be living in, to be living in a perpetual state of war and uh, causing trouble to your neighbors and killing people. I mean, it's just awful, but that's the, that, that was the reality of it. Now we have, a, you know, extra biblical evidence for these, you know, these razias that, the, you know, the kings used to go out and do. Uh, but they're actually, there's actually a story in the book of Genesis in chapter 14 um, where um, Abraham is actually caught up in one of these razias. And Abraham is um, is in in uh, uh, somewhere near Jerusalem, and in the Sidon uh, valleys, the kings are fighting, and all this chaos is happening. And this is the time to capture people and take booty and and uh, you know take women and slaves and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, Lot, Abraham's nephew, gets caught up in this razia, and uh, Abraham has to you know get himself together and. Uh, you know, I mean, good on Abraham for doing that. You know, I don't, I don't know whether he used violence or not. Maybe he just used, you know, some other, you know, technique that maybe was non-violent. But you know, he was obviously, you know, going to not let his uh, nephew go. So he went and he actually got you know, lot, um, lot back and brought him back. Right after that, we have uh, a very, very interesting um, scenario, and that is that. Um, Melchizedek then comes on the scene and Melchizedek has um, an encounter with Abraham and uh, Melchizedek breaks bread and, uh, and, and drinks wine with Abraham and, and Melchizedek is the Prince of Peace. Now there are different versions as to who Melchizedek is but uh, there's no doubt as a Christian that Melchizedek is a, um, a, a type of a Messiah or most likely Jesus himself who did one of those, you know, travel things, you know, where they tra time travel things. And he actually came uh, into Jerusalem, and which was the city of peace, and he actually encountered himself with, with, um, with Abraham. Now, it's my interpretation. Sorry, a little bit of a hot day here today. Uh, it's my interpretation, and mine alone, that uh, perhaps uh, uh, Abraham never ever went out on a razia again because you've got to understand that originally Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldee and uh, uh, Chaldee was the first and the only you know major Babylonian city so his roots would have been in Babylon and he would have known all about these things and I think that um, Melchizedek showed Abraham another way the way of peace the second thing I want to talk about when we talk about a mystery Babylon um, is the female deities. The female deities were very, very powerful in mystery Babylon, in, in Babylon, I should say, not mystery Babylon. Uh, uh, and there was Ayana and there was Ishta and there was um, Nana, the moon god, uh, whose you know, symbol was the crescent. 
and they were very powerful and to some extent they also controlled the kings and sometimes they even controlled Marduk which is you know a bit oh, a bit unusual but that's what they did um, these female deities have morphed over the years into other uh, female deities that are worshipped and um, they are not in the Bible. Female deity worship is not something that's in the Bible in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. It is something that is outside of the Bible. And nowadays we see a resurgence of this female deity worship in very prominent places, uh, for example, with uh, the music industry, where they're actually um, looking like Ishtar or um, wearing these very elaborate costumes. And as you know, the women walk down these um, pathways or these paths that you know people are actually um, throwing themselves on the ground and worshiping them, or they are being lifted up, you know, like as in being exalted above above the people, and people are adoring these women and worshiping them. Very much part of the feminist movement, and uh, seriously, I think that there is a spiritual um, force behind these things, and it's not a very nice one. There were certain titles for these uh, ladies of heaven and they were literally called Lady of Heaven. They were called Our Lady, My Lady, My Lady, My Helper, all those kind of things which are terms that have been transferred down through the ages and have been now, I think, um, uh, made, made their way into certain religious groups uh, in the world at the moment. So these uh, female deities, I just want to say one, th one more thing about them. I'll just have a quick look at my notes and see if I missed anything. I just wanted to say one more thing. Sorry, I have to put my glasses on. The one more thing I wanted to say about these female deities is that um, Judaism, parts of Judaism um, from some of the books that I've read about Kabbalah, are not really immune to having a female deity. We certainly know that uh, the Jewish people were sometimes caught up with the Canaanite female deities uh, in the Old Testament, but they refer to the Sabbath as the Queen of Heaven. I thought that was, I was a bit concerned about that because uh, Jesus really specified when he came to this earth what the Sabbath was. And what he said the Sabbath was, was he said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So I think that when the Sabbath is lifted up, lifted up and called the Lady of Heaven or Our Lady or the Queen of Heaven, then I think that there is something seriously wrong with the day and what it, what it was meant to do and what it was meant to be. So God made man and then God in his mercy made the Sabbath and he gave man one day of rest so man can just rest and basically take it easy and the animals can rest very very important to understand the Sabbath rest was not just for man it was for the animals those animals worked really really hard and also the land needed a Sabbath everything needs a break so God gave that for that purpose the Sabbath is not the Queen of Heaven and I've seen a lot of Christians even now referring to the Sabbath as the Queen of Heaven. And I think what you are referring to when you say that is basically an ancient Babylonian deity. Human sacrifice. I'm going to have to wear my glasses and you're going to have to put up with a bit of a, a purple tint, I'm afraid. A human sacrifice is very, very much a part of ancient Babylon. Spells, omens, and curses are a part of Babylon. Astrology, reading your star signs and looking for signs in the heavens, is part of Babylon. Portals and gates. Now, I just want to mention this a little bit here because this is very interesting that in these ancient, really, really ancient places in the world where ISIS have pretty much destroyed everything and the whole place is blown up. But, you know, the gate, the gate that led these people in these ancient places to some of the most cruelest and the most vicious sacrifices and human sacrifices and probably even nowadays the Christians were probably 
most likely uh, sacrificed there, that these gates um, entrances somehow remain intact and then they are brought, um, I don't know who brings them, but they are brought to some of the most uh, prestigious locations in Western culture and Western civilizations and they are put there and people go and they gather and they look at these gates and they honor these gates and they walk through these gates like they're walking into some kind of a portal. And these portal and gates are really uh, very much part of Babylon and it's that Babylonian influence that is now coming into Western countries and I believe that there are entrances uh, into hell itself. Branding is something that is very Babylonian and is something that has infiltrated the church. Christians are very much caught up in money making. They love to write books to make money. Um, they love to make videos to make money. They will do anything pretty much, even sell their soul to make money. Um, I think that money has become a tremendous uh, god in Christianity. And Christian people who make money from selling stuff should really be ashamed of themselves. And uh, they don't just make it even just to survive. They make millions and multiple of millions of dollars and they create brands for themselves. Branding and marketing yourself and marketing is very much um, part of Babylon and originated from Babylon. Uh, Babylon were the first people in, uh, in the history of the world to actually brand themselves and brand their products and brand uh, things that people, when they looked at them, they identified them with Babylon. And so when people look at a brand or they look at a color or they look at uh, something that associates with you, like an icon or a symbol, you then automatically become a brand. And unfortunately, Christians have fallen hook, like, hook, line and sinker for this whole brand association and this marketing thing and this money-making thing, which is really a big embarrassment, I think. And it's a shame. It really is a shame. And we need to turn this ship around because it's not the way that Jesus wanted us to go. Organized religion is something that I don't want to really uh, talk a lot about because I, I do intend to make another video about other stuff that is uh, part of Mystery Babylon. But organized religion um, and the more and more that people um, uh, become uh, organized in the way that they, 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 they structure their churches and the way that they structure their, um, their associate churches and everything else can very much be a part of Mystery Babylon. So come out of her, my people. Come out of organized religion. Come out of organized religion and be you separate is what Jesus said in the book of Revelation. The other part of Babylon which I won't delve a lot into uh, because I think that it's very very difficult to actually deal with this one finance and banking and stock markets and buying and selling of shares and all those things were very much part of Babylon and um, yeah there again you know ba Babylon was the uh, center of money making and enterprise. To finish off I just want to say that in this video, excuse me, to finish off I just want to say that in this video I don't want us to think about Babylon as a who because that's it's not it's silly. I need to th we need to think about Babylon as a what? And we need to come up with all these different things that are traditionally uh, Babylon and that have carried on through the years and that are very much a part of our society. Now why is this really important for Christians? Because I'll tell you why. Because Jesus and I, I, God has had enough of Babylon. He's had Babylon up to about here. And Babylon is about to get judged very, very soon. And the warning in the book of Revelation has not been heeded in the way that it should be. When God says, you know, come out of her, my people, and be separate. And people don't 
know what they're supposed to come out of because there's all been this confusion about, oh, we just come out of the Catholic Church and we're not in Babylon. We'll come out of Islam and we're not in Babylon or we come out of a secret society and we're not in Babylon. But when you actually look at Babylon uh, differently, as in what? Then you start to research and find out all those things that are Babylon that are very much influenced our lives today. And just like God took Abraham on a journey of faith, and just like God took the children of Israel in, through a journey in the desert through faith, uh, God is going to take us uh, on a journey in these end times. And he's going to teach us about faith. And one of those things we're going to have to let go along the way is we're going to have to let go of Babylon and the influences that Babylon has over our daily lives. So if Babylon is here, you really want to be running the other way, as far away as you possibly can, and you don't want to be anywhere near Babylon. Because God is going to tear Babylon apart. Trust me, God is going to tear Babylon apart. And the warning is that if we are anywhere near Babylon, that we are actually going to get judged with her. And if you want to know some of those judgments, then please read the book of Revelation and you'll find out what's about to happen to Babylon. And you don't want those things to happen to you. So I will do another video because there are more things that are Babylonian that we need to come out of. And I just want to thank you for listening. And um, if you have any questions, just contact me. Thank you so much. Bye.